Riders, Ridettes, and Pillions, welcome to the Van Blam YouTube channel and welcome to another multi-day tour on my Triumph Speed Twin. Over the next week, we'll be riding from Missoula, Montana, down through Idaho, over into Wyoming, and back up through Montana. And we'll be doing it all without the use of GPS navigation, just a map and a compass. This is the No GPS Tour 2021. All right, we are starting here at Lolo Pass, just over the border from Montana into Idaho. The sky looks smaller already. Let's take a look at the map and I'll show you where we're going today. Okay, so we are here right where 12 crosses the border from Montana into Idaho. We follow this for, I guess about 100 miles or so to Kuskia, Idaho then take 13 south for a few miles until it splits off into 14 and sort of ventures into the Clearwater Mountains to Elk City. That's where we're spending the night tonight. There aren't really any towns or services between here and Kuskia, but I filled up in Lolo, so I should have enough gas to make it there. I tried. Let's hit the road. If any of you ever ride through Lolo Pass and that sticker happens to still be on the sign, take a photo of it and send it to me on Instagram or by email and I will mail you a prize. I love the way this road runs along the river like this and it hugs it really close. No guardrail or anything. I've ridden plenty of roads that run along creeks, but this is a proper river. I don't know where the idea came from to forego GPS navigation on this trip, but once I got the idea in my head, I knew I had to do it. It just seems so fitting to use an old school navigation method when traveling on an old school motorcycle, or at least one that looks old school. I'm pretty good with maps and I have a good sense of direction, so I think I can do it without much trouble. Knock on wood. Now, based on YouTube analytics, I could surmise that a lot of you watching have probably done your share of motorcycle travel before GPS navigation was even invented, or at least before it became commonplace. So to you, this might not seem like a huge accomplishment. But for me, I got my first smartphone with built-in GPS when I had had my driver's license for only about three years. That means that for over a decade now, the vast majority of my adulthood, I've relied solely on my little black rectangle to give me turn-by-turn -turn directions whenever I needed to get somewhere new. And even those of you whose motorcycling careers started long before the birth of Google Maps, I have to ask, when was the last time you actually navigated somewhere using only paper? That wasn't a gotcha question or anything. I'm genuinely curious. If any of you do still take trips like this without the use of electronic navigation aids, let me know in the comments below what your motivation is for doing that, what you like about it. 
I'll be answering that question for myself over the next week, and I'm excited to be sharing the experience with you guys. sign there says Kuskia is in 60 miles and my estimated range is 133 so we should be good I knew going into this that not being able to just open up my phone and type in where's the nearest gas would mean that I would have to be a little more careful and proactive about filling up my gas tank but something else that I didn't really consider is that I'm never really gonna know when the next bathroom is gonna show up. It's about 90 degrees today, and tomorrow and the next day are gonna be even hotter. So I'm hydrating like crazy, but that means that pretty much as soon as I leave one bathroom, half an hour later I've gotta go again, and I have no idea how long I'll have to hold it. Worth it though, hydrate or dehydrate. How's it going? Alright. Have you been up this way before? No, I haven't. Man, it's probably gravel. I'm about to continue down 12. Oh, okay. Have a good one. Okay, so I've seen a couple of these things, and I had to stop and check this one out. It's some kind of cable? running across the river oh man and it looks like there's a little a little carriage does this shuttle people across the river that's so cool look somebody delivered a package there waiting to be taken across <laughs> Okay, Kuskia City Center. I believe we're done with Route 12. I think this is where we pick up the next leg of the trip. And first we're gonna get some gas. Actually first, we're gonna ooh at this neat bridge. Ooh, neat bridge. There we are. Right as the gas light came on. Well done. Alright, so it looks like from Kuskia, we just take 13 south, about 10 or 15 miles. We pass through Harpster, and after that, there's a fork between Route 13 and 14, and we'll take Route 14 all the way to Elk City. Piece of cake. Right. Looks like left is the way to 13. Alright, so I'll tell you a little bit more about the rules for this trip. Obviously, I can't use any electronic navigation, no GPS, no Google Maps, nothing on my cell phone. I have to just use paper maps and a compass if I need it. I am allowed to acquire new paper maps during the course of this trip. I'm also allowed to refer to publicly posted maps like at rest stops and visitor centers and things, but I am not allowed to take photos of those maps. Another resource I'm not allowed to use is the weather app on my phone because that uses location services, so by opening it up, it would immediately give away my exact location. One electronic resource I am allowed to use is the FAA's Air Map app. That's because I don't want to accidentally fly my drone somewhere that's going to get me in trouble, get a fine in the mail or something like that. But I am only allowed to open air map once I have determined my present location with a reasonable degree of certainty. And after that, I'm only allowed to look at my planned flight path. I can't 
you know, scout around and see where I'm going or anything. The one other resource I can use if I get really, really desperately lost is I can ask someone for directions. I hope it doesn't come to that, but introvert humor aside, I will, of course, bust out Google Maps if I have like a serious emergency and need to find a hospital or guide a recovery vehicle to my location or something like that. You know, when I plan trips on Google Maps like normal, it kind of gives me a pretty good idea of what to expect scenery wise, but the map doesn't do that. I'm kind of surprised at how pretty it is here and I like that. Entering Harpster. All right, that means that pretty soon we're going to be looking for that fork with Route 14. If I wind up in Grangeville, then I'll know I've gone too far. And here we are, Junction, Idaho 14, Elk City to the left. So 49 miles to Elk City. This is going to be a real pretty road, but I don't think I'm going to show it today because I will be coming back out this way in the morning. So I think what I'll do today, since it is just so, so hot, I'll just ride straight there and then in the morning when it's cooler on my way out, that's when I'll film like a nice little montage on this road. Elk City. This is our destination for the day. Not a terribly difficult route to navigate today, but it's only day one. We'll see what happens over the next week as I make my way across Idaho and through Wyoming. <laughs> I was about to say we made pretty good time today, but then I remembered we crossed into the Pacific time zone when we came into Idaho. Ooh, wow, this is pretty out here. I swear I'm trying to keep my GoPro lens free of bugs. And here we are, Elk City Hotel. Ooh. Oh my god, my butt hurts. Gee whiz. Holy crap. Today is day two of the journey. Today we're riding from Elk City to Loman. Elk City was a neat little town, emphasis on little. There was a store, a hotel, and a diner, and not much else. I left as early as possible this morning to beat the heat, but I spent so long filming on Route 14 that it's now about 90 degrees, and I've made it about a quarter of the way through my route for the day. I'll be taking 14 the rest of the way to Grangeville, then 95 south, 
55 South. And finally, I'll be cutting over to the east on the Banks Loman Highway to Loman, which is our destination for the evening. Do I have a bug on my lens? I swear, you guys, I'm going to try a little bit harder to keep my lens free of bugs today. But it's hard. They show up almost as fast as I can wipe them away. And the gunk they leave behind is just, it's like cement. I need, um, you know how the MotoGP riders have like the peel away films on their visor and every couple laps it gets covered in crap and they just tear it off and there's, there's a clear one underneath. I need a, a layer of those for my GoPro lens. Okay, I'm guessing this is Grangeville. I didn't see a sign or anything. So somewhere around here I need to pick up 95 South. Also need to grab some gas, so maybe I'll check the map while I do that. It started raining back there in Grangeville. Uh, only lasted a few minutes, but I didn't get a chance to pull the map out, so I had to make kind of a split second decision. I don't think this map would have been much help though, because while it does have zoomed in versions of some towns in the state, Grangeville was not one of them. It's just a black dot. So thankfully I ended up seeing a sign for 95 South. We'll take this down to New Meadows where we'll pick up 55. Uh, it looks like we might be catching up to that rainstorm as we head south. Whoa, check this out. Coming down the far side of Whitebird Hill. This is worth putting the long lens on my camera. Well, it's starting to rain, so I think I'm going to put my rain gear on, because I don't know how long this is going to last. In mountainous places like this where the weather is hyper localized and precipitation can come and go at a moment's notice, oftentimes the best rain gear is just a heavy throttle hand. Ooh, entering mountain time zone. Okay, that was it. We only spent one day on Pacific time. I'll go ahead and set my clock forward. All right, so it's now 3 p.m. instead of 2 p.m. And the diner at the South Fork Lodge closes at 8 p.m., which means I've basically got less than five hours to go 160 miles-ish. All right, entering New Meadows and 55 South. Piece of cake. 
All right, so you know I'm only using maps for this trip, but I want to talk about what specific maps I'm using. I brought two maps with me for this trip. Uh, one that's just a map of Idaho, and one that's a map of Wyoming and Montana. The ones I went with are the Rand McNally Easy to Fold variety. They make two different varieties of their pocket-sized state maps, uh, Easy to Fold and Easy to Read. The Easy to Fold ones are, as the name implies, Easy to Fold. They're a little bit smaller and they're laminated, which is nice. The easy to read maps are bigger, of course, and they're plain paper. They're not laminated like the easy to fold ones are. When I was researching these, I found that all of the easy to fold maps have terrible reviews on Amazon. It seemed like everyone was saying that the easy to fold map is really hard to read and you should go with the easy to read map instead. Somebody said Rand McNally needs to include a free magnifying glass with the purchase of the easy to fold maps. Based on that consensus, I was prepared to go with the easy to read maps. That is until I went to the store and held both of them in my hand side by side. It turns out I'm just the only person who knows how to read a f***ing map. The easy to fold maps are not difficult to read at all, and they don't sacrifice any valuable detail in order to meet that smaller form factor. And I gotta hand it to them, they are pretty damn easy to fold. One of the reviews on the easy to read map said, any idiot can fold a map, buy this one instead. Well to you, I would say any idiot can learn how to read a map by the laminated one. I did an Outward Bound course once in 2015, uh, four days of backpacking and rock climbing, and when I showed up, I was the only person there out of eight adult students who knew how to read a topograph. So I don't know, maybe map reading is something I'm better at than the average person, but I think it's a skill anyone can learn. I received a little pin when I finished that course. Uh, in fact, it's stuck to the backpack I'm wearing right now. I bring it with me on adventures like this one to remind myself that I'm usually capable of more than I think I am. All right, I guess this is Banks, which makes this the Banks Loman Highway. Loman, 33 miles. Ooh, that's better than I thought. By better than I thought, I mean shorter than I thought. I am exhausted and I'm ready to get there. This has been about, gosh, I guess by the time I get there, this has been like an 11 hour day in the saddle. Yesterday was seven hours, 90 degrees both days and humid. Now an Idaho 95 is not nearly as bad as a DC 95 but it's worse than a Colorado 95. This is what the Van Blamp channel is all about, you guys. Riding motorcycles and complaining about the weather. I'll be spending two nights in Loman, uh, giving myself a chill day tomorrow, save for maybe one short ride that I'm kind of interested in. One of the lessons that I learned on my last trip of this type that I took is that it really helps me to give myself off days, especially after multiple consecutive, really long, tiring days of riding. Looks like we're here, South Fork Lodge, quarter mile. Guys, this road that we rode in on, I didn't show you even a fraction of the natural beauty and incredible landscape I was riding through. I hope that if nothing else, these videos inspire you to take trips like this on your own, and maybe you'll come ride the Banks Loman Highway someday.
Bugs. Do you notice anything different about my speed twin this morning? Anything at all. That's right, no luggage. Today is day three of my seven day tour, but I'm taking a layover, spending two nights here in Loman, Idaho. That means I didn't need to have my luggage on the bike today. And this highlights perhaps my favorite feature of the saddlebags I use, the SW Motec Blaze saddlebags. And that's that when you remove them from the bike, they leave it looking completely clean. There's no big ugly metal bracket there underneath their rear subframe. I'll talk more about them and the way I have this bike set up for touring later in this video. For now, let's finish this little ride, get back to the lodge and just chill out so that we'll be totally fresh to ride to Jackson, Wyoming tomorrow. Okay, that's all you get. I'm allergic. Well guys, it finally happened. Crashed my drone into that tree like 10 seconds after liftoff. It hit somewhere around the top and then I saw and heard it tumble all the way down to the bottom. So it's down there somewhere. I'm gonna go see if I can find it. RIP. Alright, so obviously it's a little bit banged up. Uh, <laughs> the battery is gone. I couldn't find that down there. But I have spares. And nothing seems to be like bent. You know, none of the uh, props or arms or anything. It's missing a foot down here. I'm not holding my breath, but I'm gonna give it a try. Oh my god. If this works. Alright, it's connected. But can it take off? Oh my god. Oh my god, you magnificent son of a bitch. <laughs> Alright, back to the montage. All 
so if you ever have trouble remembering which US state is which, the way I do Idaho is remember that it looks like a hand making a finger pointing gesture. So I just remember it as Idaho, no Utaho. All right, it is now the morning of day four. I spent the afternoon just hanging around the South Fork Lodge yesterday in Loman, recovering from those two very long, very hot days of riding. I really liked the South Fork Lodge. It was a neat place. It was beautiful, of course, and the roads surrounding it were just awesome. I noticed that just like Montana and Colorado, the cool paved mountain roads had tons of dirt roads branching off of them. I think it would be really fun to come in there on like a dual sport or a Himalayan or something, come in on the paved roads, stay at the lodge for a couple days exploring the dirt forest roads, and then leave by the paved road again. That would be a nice trip. I ate dinner at the lodge too. I of course had to try the elk burger, which was really, really okay. It was okay. And yes, that is a side salad that I got with it. It's really hard to eat healthy on a motorcycle trip like this, so I try to cut my body a break any chance I get. Pretty much the only food I can feasibly bring with me is like snacks, jerky and stuff like that. So yes, I crashed my drone this morning as I was filming that montage. Actually, that was on the opposite side of that mountain range over there. Flew straight into a tree, probably about 80 feet off the ground, and I swear I heard it hit every single branch on the way down. And sure enough, the damn thing still flies. DJI, thank you for making such a tough product. If that drone had died, I would have, I don't know, I would have had to start a Patreon or something. Today we'll be traveling all the way across Idaho to Jackson, Wyoming by way of Idaho Falls, which is about a 350 mile trip. But first we'll be hitting the town of Stanley where we're going to have a little bit of a decision to make. So this is Stanley, Idaho, and we're about to have a choice to make here at this intersection. So we can either take 75 South or 75 North to 93 South. Both ways will get us to Idaho Falls. But I saw on the map that 93 South has a lake with a dam. And dams are neat. So I'm gonna go that way. and 93 South. Damn it. I hate bugs. Neat. Have a nice day. Here in Arco, I think I'm actually going to take this opportunity to do a little load of laundry. I don't have enough space in these bags to pack clothes for the entire trip, but I also can't really re-wear anything because I have been absolutely sweating my ass off the last couple days. I sweated so much in this leather jacket that sweat has run from the armpit seam and stained the leather. Thank you. 
So while we wait for that load of laundry, this might be a good time to talk about my motorcycle, my 2019 Triumph Speed Twin. I just realized I'm four days into this motorcycle trip and I have yet to talk about the bike itself. And the reason for that is that this motorcycle is what my entire YouTube channel was founded on. So I've already talked about it in depth in lots of other videos in the past that I would encourage you to check out if you're curious. I've talked about riding it in the city, I've talked about riding it in the mountains, I've talked about modding it, and I've even talked about touring on it. But for those of you who might be new to my channel, I'll just give you a brief overview of this bike, what I've done to it, and how I have it set up for this trip. So it's a 2019 Speed Twin. That's the original version. They did just announce an updated one as I record this. It's a fun 1200cc retro naked sport bike with about 96 horsepower, and it's an absolute blast to ride. But I did need to make a few changes of it to get it just the way I wanted it. One of those changes was the tires. It came with Pirelli Diablo Rosso 3s, which were more or less wasted on me. That's a super sport tire and I am not a super sport rider. So once those squared off, I replaced them with these Michelin Road 5s. Next, I've got these uh, CRG Hindsight Lane Splitter mirrors. Uh, now the bike comes with bar end mirrors and I did like those a lot, but I think these look just a little bit better and I like the fact that you can fold them in when you need to clear a tight gap. I have the Tech Bike Parts Progressive Front Fork Springs with the top nut adjusters, as well as the Tech Bike Parts Rear Shocks with the Reservoir. I hope you can see that in there. I always felt that the stock suspension was fine for my weight and riding style, but there was room for improvement in the handling department, especially as it relates to carrying a pillion, and I would say that this Tech suspension did the trick. I also have these Koso Apollo heated grips here. Um, they work pretty well and I like the integration, but the installation process was kind of a pain in the butt. I think it would have been worth uh, springing for the OEM Triumph heated grips. Now we move into my actual touring setup. I use the SW Motec Blaze saddlebags. They're a semi-rigid saddlebag that are 14 liters each unless you zip these gussets out and then they become 21 liters each. Uh, what I like about them is that when you remove them, the bracket that they rest on is also removable. This metal bar here, you slide that out and all that's left is this little black housing that piggybacks on the pillion foot peg support looks totally clean. You would hardly even know it's there. So on days like yesterday, when I don't actually need to travel to another destination, I just remove the saddlebags, remove the support arms, remove this, and then I have a totally unladen motorcycle, totally clean looking uh, to enjoy on the mountain roads and in front of the camera. Lastly, I've just got this uh, sort of dry bag here uh, with all my rain gear in it, my jacket, pants, and gloves, my boots that I wear, the Tour Master Solution WP. Those are waterproof on their own, so I don't need to change those when it starts raining, but I keep this bag just strapped down with a bungee net. The Blaze bags have been working out really well for me. I wish they were a little bit bigger, uh, but they haven't given me any technical problems. Nothing's breaking, nothing's wearing out. It just seems like a well-made product that functions as advertised. In one of them, I have laptop and charger, chain lube, a tool kit that I threw together, a tire plug kit, and a pair of street shoes and jeans, because I don't need to be walking around town in these bad boys in the evening. I've also got my toiletries in there. Then the other side is all clothes, chargers, and food. Food is in this one. Then all my camera gear is in my backpack, along with a few other odds and ends. Now I'm going to head over and see if that laundry is done so we can get back on the road. Alright, we are back out on the road heading for Idaho Falls. Got some clean clothes in the saddlebag. I kind of wish I had changed into my jeans and then washed my riding pants. These things absolutely reek but I'll just have to deal with it or see if I can find another laundromat later in the trip. So there are two questions that I know people are gonna ask me about the Speed Twin. One is, does it have cruise control? And the answer is no. I also do not wish that I had cruise control. I feel completely fine just holding the throttle at the right position for however long I need to. The other question I know someone is gonna ask is, how do I deal with not having a windscreen? And the answer is, I just do. Um, 
wind blast just doesn't bother me on motorcycles. Maybe if I was going to spend all day, multiple days in a row going 90 or 100 miles an hour, but that's not what I do. Uh, I keep my freeway cruising to a minimum, and even when I do have to spend a couple hours going 70 or even 80 miles an hour, it's not that bad. So no, throttle hand cramps and wind fatigue are not what wear me out on this motorcycle. What does wear me out is the seat. It's comfortable for a while. I've definitely sat on way worse seats, but it's not great either. I would say that after about somewhere between 200 and 250 miles, my butt starts to hurt real bad. And by 250 to 300 miles, I am no longer having fun. If I wanted to take trips like this on a more regular basis, I would have to invest in some kind of touring seat. Maybe the Corbin, I mean, it's probably the best, but it's also not very good looking. I don't know, if you have any suggestions, leave them in the comments below. All right, so this is Idaho Falls, and we need to find 20, uh, oh, there it is, 26 North. It even says Jackson, and here we are, 26 North. I failed to hit record beforehand, but we just made a left turn onto Idaho 31 from Swan Valley. And man, this whole navigating thing is easy. I've had no trouble negotiating any of these routes these past few days. I thought that this whole no GPS gimmick was going to be like, ooh, what's the millennial going to do without his precious smartphone? How's he going to know where to go? Like, I thought people would be tuning in wanting to see me get lost but that hasn't been the case it turns out if you just read the map and pay attention to your surroundings it's no trouble getting from place to place it's almost as if maps were invented for this very purpose Man, is this a gorgeous stretch of road or what? Look at those peaks over there. Is that the Grand Tetons? I guess we'll find out tomorrow. I want to give a special shout out to Steve and Sean, two guys who I met earlier today when I was stopped over by that dam. I wish I knew a little bit more about cruisers so that I could say what they were riding, but whatever. Uh, we talked for a few minutes and they gave me a recommendation for a route for getting to Jackson and that brought us over that awesome mountain pass and into this beautiful scenery. If it hadn't been for you guys, I would have just ridden straight through Alpine and had no idea what I was missing. Just goes to show you, GPS is great, maps work fine too, but sometimes there is just no substitute for local wisdom. Thank you guys. You know the drill. Come find this sticker, take a picture of it and send it to me and I will send you a present. And here we are, Jackson, Wyoming. It's been a long day in the saddle, about 12 hours and 350 miles and I am beat. I was originally going to spend two nights here in Jackson uh, until I saw the price of hotels. <laughs> so I'm just spending one night to the tune of, and mind you, this is not the Holiday Inn. This is not even the Holiday Inn Express. This is Motel 6, $300 a night. So yeah, as much as I could use a break after today, we are gonna be checking out tomorrow morning and getting right back on the road.
Hi. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. Oh, thank you. Would you like a map? Yes, please. Thanks. You're welcome. Have a nice day. You too.
It's today. Today is day six of the No GPS Tour 2021. And today, we don't even need the map because our destination is one single road. And we just turned onto it here in Red Lodge, Montana. That road is, of course, Highway 212, Beartooth Pass. Do a quick Google search for best driving roads in America. You'll get a ton of different listicles, but almost none of them will mention Beartooth Pass. And yet, talk to someone who's ridden or driven all over this country over the course of a few decades, and they'll tell you that this is one of the places that you absolutely cannot miss. I have no idea why that is, but it makes me that much more excited about being here today. It feels like I'm being let in on a well-kept secret. The real meat of Beartooth Pass is a stretch of about 30 miles. It climbs to an altitude of almost 11,000 feet, and from what I understand, offers endless, overwhelming alpine views and switchbacks. Should be the perfect road to enjoy on my Triumph Speed Twin. some snow. Beartooth Pass snows over every year and reopens Memorial Day weekend, which as I record this was about a week ago. So there's a chance I'll encounter some pretty chilly conditions. I believe I finally made it here. Kind of feels like we're getting up to the top. I feel like I am in the sky. I'm reminded of how I felt on Pike's Peak. This feels like it's an alien planet. It's really windy up here and really cold too. Hard to believe that just three days ago in Idaho, it was so hot that I was sweating through the armpit of my leather jacket. Leaving Montana, there we go. I thought there would be a Wyoming sign or something. It is 
unbelievably cold up here. It's got to be, I mean, it's got to be in the 30s. It might even be below freezing. My little heated grips are cranking away, but I could barely even feel them. What's that? I like your bike. Thank you. It's the Speed Twin. Is it a new one? Yeah, 2019. You take care of yourself. Thank you, you too. I like that rig. I'd get something like that. Put this on the back of it, drive it around the country. That'd be awesome. Oh my god. <laughs> We're still not even at the top. Here it is, here's the summit. I want to film so much stuff, but I can hardly even bring myself to take my gloves off and get my camera out of my backpack. It's so cold and the wind is so intense. Here's a good one. You going the way down or are you heading up? I'll probably turn around here. I came from Red Lodge. That's where we came from. <laughs> yeah, so I'll, I'm going to get something to eat here and then probably head back that way. That's quite a ride, isn't it? <laughs> oh yeah, oh my god. Hey, that wood hit me up there on top of it. Holy smoke, I'm glad I was riding three instead of two like you got. What do you think, I mean, do you think it's 30 degrees up there? Colder? Hey, easy. Yeah. Because nothing's melting. I've never seen anything like it. Never have either. I've been to Grand Canyon. I always thought that was pretty neat. <laughs> I think this is right there with it. Yeah, for sure. Right there with it. How do you like this Triumph? I love it. Um, I had the old Triumph. I had a 66 Barleyville. Oh, yeah? yeah? Back when they were like a 650? Yep. Yeah. With the dual cars. Just got some coffee and a muffin there at the top of the world store. But before we get back on the road, there's one thing I gotta do. You know the drill, guys. Come find that sticker, take a photo of it, and send it to me, and I will mail you a present. I think I'm actually gonna go back the way I came, back to Red Lodge. I had originally thought about going all the way into Yellowstone to Lamar Valley in the northern part because that's supposedly a really good place to view wildlife, but that's another 30 miles away. There's a sign there that says expect delays from road work. And yesterday I rode my motorcycle within 20 feet of a buffalo, so that scratched my wildlife itch. Plus the real meat of Beartooth Pass is back this way and I'm eager to ride it again. Guys, I think something might be wrong with my bike. My dash is lit up like a Christmas tree. The ABS light is on, check engine light, traction control light, and the little service interval wrench. It's been acting kind of weird the last couple days. Um, it occasionally at idle, the idle speed will drop really low to the point that it stalls out. And pretty much every time I go to start it, uh, the first one or two times that I hit the starter button, nothing happens. I don't know what's going on. Um, I'm going to try and get back up the pass uh, without turning the bike off. That way, if it does die, I can at least coast all the way back down the other side to Red Lodge. Oh man, this sucks <laughs> if this is where my speed twin dies for no reason.
Pretty good. Sweet, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Me too. Thank you, Ralph. Be safe. You too. Hopefully she starts up. All right, engine started. Okay, seems normal so far. Uh, the lights were going off by this time before. This may uh, hinder how much footage I'm able to get for this video. What I do when I'm making a video about a road like this is I ride it once uh, to you know record my reactions and get the first person riding footage. And then I ride it again stopping at all the stopping points to get my b-roll with the sony camera and with the drone and everything but i don't know if i'm afraid that something's gonna go wrong with the bike every time i start it up then i'll be keeping those filming stops to a minimum sadly still though i feel very lucky that i got to come here at all we're about halfway down the montana side I thought maybe I'd fly the drone, but it's still too windy. Fingers crossed. Oh. I don't know what to think about this, but I've lost a lot of trust in this motorcycle's reliability in the last day, and Beartooth Pass is not where I want to find myself stranded. I want to, at the very least, get back to my hotel in Red Lodge, and then hopefully tomorrow it can get me back across the state to Missoula where my car and trailer are and after that I can just haul it back home to DC so yeah it sucks if something's really wrong with it but all I really needed to do is get me back to Missoula so as disappointed as I am about losing confidence in my motorcycle I'm even more disappointed about the footage that I missed out on that I could have gotten I could have gotten more flybys, more b-roll of overlooks. I mean, I didn't show you guys even a fraction of what Beartooth Pass has to offer. So, if what you did see in this video was enough to inspire you to come here and see Beartooth Pass for yourself, well then I would consider it a huge success. And believe me, whatever you think is here, there is 10 times more. I think that, for whatever reason, the universe has been trying to prevent me from riding Beartooth Pass. I was supposed to come here last August on my way out to Colorado. First, I was going to stop in the Black Hills of South Dakota, and then I was going to come here to ride Beartooth Pass. I even had a reservation at the same hotel I'm staying at now. But at the last second, I got strep. So I had to delay the start of that trip and go straight to Colorado instead of stopping at these places on my way there. Now I finally make it here and my motorcycle has a brain aneurysm halfway through? Yeah, I think the universe is trying to stop me from riding Beartooth Pass. But you know what, universe? F you. I did it anyway. And I don't need drone footage of the event to feel proud of it. Today is kind of the end of the story for the no GPS tour. Tomorrow I'm just going to jump on the highway and blast across the state back to Missoula. See, there, it's stalled. All I did was pull the clutch in. Oh, okay, look. Trip 1 reset a couple miles ago. Uh, probably when I restarted the bike there on that corner. I did not do that. I always reset trip one when I get gas. Oh man, this is weird. And there it goes, it stalls. Just pulled the clutch in. Oh, this is bad. Okay guys, let's see if the old Speed Twin starts up. And a one. Wow, all right. That wasn't the little intro I was hoping for. And now it's not stalling again either. Yesterday, it would have stalled out as soon as I rolled up to this stop sign. So you're just gonna be like that, huh, Speed Twin? 
all we're doing today is leaving Red Lodge, Montana and making a beeline west across the state back to Missoula where my car and trailer are. And lastly, I will of course assess how the whole no GPS thing went. After that, we'll be loading up the bike and driving back home to Virginia. And here we are about to get on Route 90 and just book it west across the state. Yep, still not stalling. Oh, I forgot to mention the other weird thing that this bike does is every time you hit the starter button, uh, regardless of whether it fails to crank or successfully cranks, every time you hit the starter button, things change in the display. It will cycle through like odometer or trip clock uh, or, you know, clock clock. Ah, shit. just missed that because I was talking. Um, and it will also, and this is more recent, it will also cycle through the rider modes, like rain, road, and sport. It'll start flipping through them while you're holding the starter button, uh, which I believe it's not supposed to do. Here's I-90, and we are going in the direction of Butt. Butt, Montana. All right, guys, well, we just got on the highway. It's very loud now, so I'm sure you don't want to listen to me yell into the microphone. And also, this is my absolute least favorite thing to do on a motorcycle. Uh, so I think I'm just going to catch up with you later. I think for now, uh, I'm just going to take a little nap. All right, so see you in a few. Whoa. Ooh, man, my gas light's on. How long have I been out? Ah, and there it is, guys. Hopefully you can see that. ABS light flashing and check engine light and traction control light keep coming on. There's the service interval wrench keeps coming on. All right, getting gas in Cardwell. I think we made it far enough that this next tank will get us all the way to Missoula. I can't tell you exactly how far we got on the previous tank, because somewhere along the way, my odometer stopped working. It did eventually start working again, but I swear I rode at freeway speeds for a good, a good 10 minutes or so, and the odometer never went up. Now the real test is going to be, will it start? And a one. And a two. And a three. Shit. Bike won't start. I have a dead battery? I've got no power. Alright, there's a slight slope to the entrance of this gas station, so I'm going to walk it up that and see if I can bump start it on the way down. <sighs> okay. now. Uh, ignition's on. Okay. Uh, no. Not enough momentum to uh, turn the engine. Great. I'll go park in the shade. See if anybody can give me a jump. God, I don't f***ing believe this. All 
all right so i've been over here in the shade debating what to do um <laughs> my first thought was do i get AAA and get them to uh, tow me all the way back to missoula which is 155 miles away um, i only have the basic AAA, which is like five free miles uh, so that would be a very long, very expensive tow. I thought about maybe getting it towed to Butte, which is, like, not as far. That's, like, maybe... That, you know, at this point, that might be, like, 30 or 40 more miles. I'm still not getting my GPS out. thought about getting it towed to Butte, and maybe I could, like, leave it somewhere there, get a rental car, drive myself back to Missoula, get my car and my trailer, haul it back to Butte, put the bike on the trailer get it back that way so I looked under the seat and I noticed that the rubber cover on my red terminal was like melted it's like melted onto the screw there and I thought that's super weird it's like it has a short or something like why would it be heating up like that so what I did I mean I <laughs> I could have done this in a less destructive way but what I did was I just cut off the wires for my Koso Apollo heated grips which were wired directly onto the battery just snipped them and when I turned the key a minute ago the dash powered on again and I heard the fuel pump were up and everything so I'm wondering if that if that was a short or something if that was the cause of all the issues or at least if it was the cause of what seemed to be the ignition issue um, who knows if it's related to the ABS thing, you know, the dash, whatever, changing whenever I hit the starter. Um, but that could be what was causing it to stall out and idle badly. I have no idea. I really have no idea. So what I need to do now is button everything back up, put my luggage back on, and see if I can start the bike. And if I can, then I gotta jump on that highway and just go and make it back to Missoula before, I don't know, before something else bad can happen. Um, whew. If those Koso grips were the cause of this, uh, I don't know what to think. I, I've talked enough. I just got to give it a try and see if we can get out of here. All right. Here goes nothing. Kickstand up. We're in first gear. Oh my god, it worked. Let's get the f out of here. All I have to do is not come to a complete stop at any time for any reason between here and Missoula. All right, we just made it through Butte, Montana. Uh, so far, so good. Just got done crawling through a construction zone and it looks like we may be headed into some weather. If that's the case, then I'll probably have to stop recording this video uh, because my GoPro is not waterproof when I have the microphone plugged into the little side port. Ooh. Yeah, that really, really looks like precipitation. I'm gonna pull under here. Time to put on my rain gear. Come on, baby.
So the Speed Twin did get me safely back to Missoula. I'm not gonna delve into it any further today uh, because you're probably watching this several months after I filmed it. So there's a good chance I've already resolved this issue and posted an update about it on my channel. In which case I will link to that in the description below. So anyway, I guess it's time to talk about uh, the gimmick of this trip, so to speak. Uh, no GPS. I went however many miles it was over the course of seven days uh, without ever once opening a navigation app on my phone. Here's a little screenshot to prove it. I don't know, I don't know if that means anything to anybody, but I really did not open Google Maps for the seven days that I was on the road. And honestly, it was way easier than I thought it would be. I thought this whole thing was going to be like, oh, what's this millennial going to do without his cell phone? Um, it was easy. You just look at the map and it, it tells you where to go. Half the time, even on the days that I used it, I didn't even really need it because I knew roughly where I was going and the road signs at, you know, highway junctions were enough to, to get me to where I was going. And I will say, navigating with the maps was fun. Uh, it, I feel like it kind of added to that I don't know, I guess the sense of freedom that makes us all love motorcycles so much. You're kind of untethered from, you just feel a little more independent and I would definitely do it again. But I'm not trying to come away from this video being like, oh, technology bad, old ways good. Uh, a lot of the places that I was going, you know, when I picked this general route um, in the weeks prior to leaving, I did use Google Maps for that. That's how I learned about these interesting places and roads that I wanted to go visit. So even though I used the maps during the course of the trip, um, I still owe GPS or owe Google Maps uh, for the fact that I even knew to go to these places at all. And I know that <laughs> based on Google Analytics, most of the people watching these videos are older than me, so I'm guessing a majority of you have plenty of experience navigating road trips with only maps, you know, before GPS navigation was pocket-sized. And so if you don't think this was a big deal, then that's fine. I just hope you've enjoyed watching. And to anybody else of any age watching, I would hope that this trip has maybe inspired you to take your motorcycle and maybe push your comfort zone just a little bit. Find something that you're not entirely sure you're able to do and go do it. Who knows, whatever it is might be way easier than you think. Well, anyways, it's time for me to load this bike up, get home and start planning my next adventure, I guess. This has, uh, this has been a good ride. I'm gonna remember this one. <sighs> And a one. And a two. And a three. Oh. You're kidding. It won't start again? How am I supposed to get it on the trailer? Well guys, if you're still here, if you've stuck around until the end of the video, then you are the real Van Fam. Sound off in the comments below and leave a like so that I know you're here. I am grateful for each and every person who has shared in this journey with me. It's your views and support that keep me making videos like this. As always, you ride safe and I will see you back here for the next adventure. There we go. Oh.
Oh, goodness. Don't fall over. 